G'day and welcome back to True Footy. For those of you who don't watch or listen to the True Footy podcast, I am known as Bush, Busher, Bush Daddy, Hey You Behind the Bushes, among other spin-offs of the word Bush. Why the word Bush? That's for you to find out and me to know. To preface this video, I have just watched Jesse's video that he released and his explanation of his upcoming plans and the future of him travelling and enjoying himself in Europe. And the expansion plans for the channel, of course, going in a few different directions. And of course, someone who's been on the podcast. I've been sitting on this video idea for a few months. I've kept procrastinating on it. So I thought I'd make it and surprise Jesse with it when he comes over on Sunday to record a podcast. My personal journey over the last couple of years, the ups and downs, mostly downs, has sort of led me to the journey that's sort of taken me down the fantasy sports path. And in particular, I think, as an AFL channel, I can obviously make a bit of content about AFL fantasy and sort of add a bit of different flavour to the channel, I guess. That personal journey I alluded to, the those lows that I alluded to in particular, that began around in August 2021 when I was playing basketball and tore my ACL. Rather, I'm sorry, I didn't tear it, I ruptured it, actually. So... That sounds a bit more dramatic, similar sort of result, less likely for me to have it heal organically. Had to wait for surgery. Didn't get surgery until December 2022. So for the last almost 18 months, year and a half, I've been laid up with a torn ACL. But that physical struggle has been nothing compared to the mental one. It all began being laid up, so that made it a lot harder to exercise and play sport and engage in activities that got the dopamine going, made me happy, so that sort of really sort of exacerbated some already existing mental struggles. But even those pre-existing mental struggles were nothing compared to when, in the space of about three months, I lost my grandmother and my mother, the two most important women in my life. And that has been quite a struggle, especially because in between their two losses, I was also diagnosed with ADHD. That's not as much of an issue. The more I've learnt about it, the more I go, yeah, that's exactly what I've been dealing with my whole life. It's good to finally have a cause to sort of know what I can work on to improve myself. So that's more of a good thing than a bad thing, I sort of guess. But it's still one of those things you bounce back and forth in your head. Anyway, back to bring it back to the point of this video. Fantasy sports, in particular, refounded interest in NFL fantasy has been something that I've been able to stick my teeth into to help me work for all these things that I've been dealing with the last two years. Like, I've always loved sports, but this added dimension's given me a bit more to sort of engage, sort of work my mind, take my mind off things. So it's it's a really good avenue for people who love sports but just need that bit extra just sort of to give them a bit more to take their mind off some of their troubles. Like, But in this video today, I would love to walk everyone through my 2022 fantasy sports journey and how it has led to where I am now, keen and fired up for my very competitive AFL Fantasy Draft League, fresh off a wooden spoon, so I'm a bit pissed off about that, and I'm keen to redeem myself, and I'd also love to use the extra effort I've put into improving that position to help the channel, help my good friend Jesse, and I'm hoping that, although my work has been mostly AFL Fantasy Draft related, that I can also apply some of that information to AFL Fantasy Classic, Hopefully we get a true footy league going on and hopefully I can be competitive in that league. At the start of 2022, the novelty of fantasy sports had well and truly sort of waned for me. I sort of just put in all my effort into the fantasy draft league for AFL each year. I'm also in an NBA league, but that's only a handful of friends and I, if any of them are watching, no offence fellas, but I feel fairly confident in that league that I sort of have a strong edge in terms of talent evaluation, work in the waivers, that sort of thing. As I was dealing with this NBA fantasy league, the AFL season was rapidly approaching and I did my usual sort of read a few articles, look into a few players, sort of tweak a few things on a spreadsheet type of arrangement that I usually do for the draft. And I won't elaborate on my draft strategy too much, because it sucked. I didn't even touch on my AFL Classic that year. I was just phoning that in, just sort of had a bit of fun with it, took the piss really. So nothing worth mentioning there. In terms of the AFL Fantasy Draft, I sort of 
No, I kind of cooked it from the beginning, considering my first pick, even though I was picking at 10 in a 10-person league, so I had the turn. My first pick was Ollie Wines, coming off a Brownlow year. I was sort of optimistic he could replicate that and sort of be a top five, top seven midfielder, producing over 110 points. That sort of felt like a solid basis for me. However, his production dropped considerably. I think going into that year, he was averaging in the one teens, whereas he ended up averaging last year 98, just under 100, I believe it was. So that was my first pick that set me up for failure. With the other first round pick, I took, oh, sorry, opening pick of the second round, I took Jack Crisp, which on its merits, good defender one. However, I did end up trading him to cover my midfield that was sorely lacking as a result of that Wines pick and not really emphasising it till later on. I ended up trading Jack Crisp in a package with some other players where I got Lockie Neal and a couple of other fringe players, which improved my win- my win- midfield, but Wines being a below starting mid, it was just sort of put me on an uphill battle from the beginning there. One draft pick I was sort of happy with, even though I ended up trading him, was Jared Witts. I took Jared Witts specifically because I knew he's a very consistent scorer, whose sort of range of possibilities is very consistent and something that you can predict and build the rest of your team's variance off of knowing he will be a consistent cog. However, my Dockers bias then kicked in and I decided to trade him for Sean Darcy, who was a bit more of a roller coaster. He had some big weeks, but he also had some not so good fantasy weeks. So that was a bit more volatile than I had in the ruck position. Another strategy that I sort of did that I think was effective, sort of helped me what little it could, considering how bad the rest of the draft was, I emphasised gambling on youth. For example, I took Nick Dacos and Jason Horn Francis back to back a lot earlier than the rest of the guys that I play the draft with would have. Obviously, Nick Dacos panned out. He was absolutely outstanding. I did quite well there. I got myself basically a defender one to replace Jack Crisp in that Lucky Neal deal, so that was a bit of a bonus. However, Jason Horn Francis was a bit more up and down. Wasn't really happy at North Melbourne either. Maybe he's a better pickup this year now that he's at Port Adelaide, but either way, he's. Not really a fantasy sort of player. He's just more of an impact with the possessions he has type of player. Anyway, after the season played out and I won the wooden spoon, that was sort of the first sort of motivating factor for me to reconsider my fantasy sports strategy. So to quickly touch back on the personal stuff, the stage of my life where I was just beginning to process my grandmother's passing and my ADHD diagnosis, begin making positive moves towards being a productive member of society again and improving my general and mental health. Then my mother passed and immediately, back in the gutter, baby. A <sighs> couple of weeks after this happened, a good friend of mine, he asked me if I was interested in playing in a $20 buy-in NFL fantasy league. I hadn't played NFL fantasy in a few years. I'd stopped following the league even longer. However, I just sort of saw this as an opportunity, something to engage my mind really just sort of stick into it, come up with a strategy, spend lots of time concentrating on thinking of every little contingency I could as just as something to take my mind off everything. That and also there was another motivating factor that considering several participants in my AFL fantasy league also played in this league, so it was a good chance for me to redeem that wooden spoon in a different competition against some of the fellas. So that was something else that motivated me. Also, it was good to expand my NFL knowledge beyond Patrick Mahomes is pretty good. As I alluded to, my actual knowledge of NFL at this point was pretty limited, so I sort of came up with a more general strategy that didn't rely on me having that intimate knowledge of the players and the offences and the offensive lines, which is a crucial one that isn't covered as much as people think. So basically, I sort of went off tier-type rankings of different players in different positions, like a tier 1 wide receiver, a tier 2 wide receiver, tier 1 tight end, that sort of thing. So I sort of used that as sort of how I evaluated talent. So I sort of knew I was picking a player that would be in that range of sort of productivity, whether that player was down for a slight regression or a slight uptick, depending on how their individual season played out, didn't matter to me as much. With this in mind, this strategy of mine, I sort of looked at a lot of different mock drafts and did my own research as well. And I sort of realized a lot of the average people participating in fantasy drafts were 
heavily valuing the running back position. A lot of the top 10 running backs were sort of expected to be gone by the end of the first round. And as I was had a late round, first round pick in this league, I sort of based my strategy around not prioritizing the wide receiver at all, sort of making sure I had premium talent in every other position. So I had a positional advantage in seven of the nine or 10 or whatever the starting positions is on the field. I knew I'd be giving up something in the running back position, but I felt my edge was significant enough in the other positions to make that up and vault me into success. And also I knew I would have the pick of like the speculative running backs, like the guys you sort of knew they're either going to whiff or they're going to blow up and have a great season. So while the rest of my league was sort of picking their wide receivers and they're sort of guys with later picks to make up for taking the running backs early. I sort of had my choice of those running backs. Where you, I got to take the best gambles, basically, is what I'm trying to say here. And I hit on a few, missed on a couple, gave me enough to get through. In the early rounds of this season, my strategy worked particularly well. I was consistently in the top three or four scorers in this 12-person league each round until my number one draft pick, Jamar Chase, was injured in the middle of the season for about four or five weeks. I was quite lucky I was sort of able to cover his absence in my lineup and I still had good positional advantage at quarterback, tight end, kicker and defense, that sort of thing. And I was still rock solid at wide receiver because I'd also taken Devontae Adams with my second pick. So my wide receiver core was pretty top notch to say the least if you know anything about NFL. In this league, I didn't really make any significant sort of trades. I made more of a couple of smaller ones, but as you'll sort of see as I continue, these smaller trades sometimes can lead to something bigger. My best trade of the year, for example, I had an excess of talent in the tight end position because I'd picked up Taysom Hill on the waivers, probably overpaid for him, but I digress. I also had Hayden Hurst because I'd picked him up as a George Kittle replacement because he was injured early in the season. Once Kittle was healthy and I had Taysom Hill, Hurst was expendable. I went to my friend in the league who had taken Cam Akers, who was sitting on LA's bench, even though if he had the position and opportunities to play and get good opportunities to run the ball he could be a productive player I knew he was a potential running back who in the back half of the season could give me something extra in running back which was obviously my weak position so I sort of targeted Cam Akers as a speculative sort of player I was probably going to drop Hayden Hurst regardless because I didn't need another tight end so I figured might as well see what I can get Akers was the best speculative guy I could target I thought so I went and went ahead with that trade and in the back half of the season, Cam Akers, after his trade request was denied, he came back to the team. They sort of kissed and made up. He ended up their number one running back, had some big games, saved my ass in the semi final with a 30 piece. It was beautiful. 30 piece is good in half PPR for those of you who aren't as big on the NFL fantasies. I also got lucky with Jamar's injury in a way. He came back healthy a couple of weeks before the playoffs, so he had a couple of tune up games to get his legs back up underneath him to really be fit and firing for the playoffs. So I had a very full-strength team going in. And once you just got to get to the playoffs in most fantasy leagues. From there, you, you're taking the players' variance. It's a bit, of luck, bit more luck involved once you're in the playoffs. But I got lucky, I guess. My guys boomed on the two weeks where I needed them to boom, and I ended up securing the championship. Won myself a nice couple hundred bucks. It was... I was quite happy to have actually achieved something like after the last few years of my life where I've been struggling even before I did my knee I had some job opportunities and stuff that didn't go the way I wanted them to so it was good to have something go right for me I guess especially something where you'd actually put the effort in put in the consistency check out Drewsy's Athlete Academy he talks about effort dedication discipline all that fun stuff that I'm sort of alluding to it has led me led me to a bit of joy for actually applying it so go check him out if you're serious about your fitness and stuff. It's probably the worst plug ever, but I'm sure he'll thank me for it. <laughs> Love you, Drews. But I digress. It was great to sort of have that achievement and have something to sort of help me get a bit of confidence back in myself, I guess. Especially because some of the guys I played with are quite passionate about it as well. They, they don't take the mickey with it. You had to be on the ball with the waivers in this league. It was a good group of fellas. It was good to have that go right for me. And that leads me into 2023. And I, the strategy that I came up with for the NFL draft, I sort of particularly felt after I'd sort of seen it succeed 
but it would also be quite applicable to the AFL drafts as well due to the different positions and sort of how you got to value when to strike on certain positions to know you're not going to be completely behind the eight ball sort of thing. You sort of need to know what when to value what position sort of thing was sort of what I prioritised rather than sort of deciding whether Nick Dacos is going to have a better season than Hayden Young sort of thing in terms of ranking defenders and all that sort of stuff in an AFL context. To simplify this strategy, I've sort of looked at the scores for each position, what I determined the average starting defender, forward, midfield, ruck would score based on top 30 defenders because there's three starting defenders in my league for 10 teams. So that's, if everything goes right, everyone should have three top 30 defenders and how that averages out depends on how early you take the good defenders or if you try and hold up later with less consistent defenders or whatever. So the strategy is sort of looking at prioritising, okay, yeah, there's only a few good forwards, so I should probably strike on the forwards early to know that I've got at least one forward that's well above average, for example. Sort of, you sort of got to look at it yourself and sort of decide what you prioritise depending on how you know your friends draft. For example, I've looked at like those trader guys. A lot, their mid, they seem to have a lot of midfielders go early, whereas the way I sort of valued it, a lot of my top ten is actually mostly forwards, just because that drop off in talent after that top handful of forwards, you're getting inconsistent key forwards. There's just so little consistency in the position. Whereas I think you can find more consistent defenders and midfielders a bit later, even if you're sacrificing some of that primo top end talent in those positions. It's a lot easier to cover for than if you don't have at least one outstanding forward dragging your average up, surrounded by what's most likely going to be a couple of other inconsistent forwards, just based on the way the position scores. It's also sort of more difficult compared to like NFL fantasy legs, where there's a lot less source material, a lot less participants in the drafts to sort of reasonably figure out how different punt the average punter is sort of going to value each position and sort of where they think there's a priority on the potential for total points scored or having an edge in a different position. My strategy sort of prioritises having an edge in your position rather than sort of the maximum sort of scoring output, which is seen in a lot of other mock drafts where a lot of the premium mids go early just because they're good for 110 plus sort of thing. Whereas I'd sort of rather have a forward that if I'm lucky they average 100, that's still going to be 20 above average scoring forward compared to a 110 mid that's only 10 above the average starting mid, for example. So that's sort of how I've sort of prioritised my draft is seeing where those gaps in value are and pounce on the players where that gap is the most apparent. I'm more than happy to divulge this information, by the way, because I imagine this video will not be released until after the draft of the Kepler. Sorry, boys. Won't know my strategy. <laughs> Although my interest in fantasy sports AFL context is more draft based than the classic where you sort of got to use your salary cap and prioritize which players you want to get in. I sort of feel that my work in the tiering and ranking the different fantasy talent has sort of given me a better idea how to sort of compare that dollar value that's attached to a player so I can sort of go, okay, yeah, this guy's got a lot more money, but I have him ranked a bit lower than his dollar value would suggest and vice versa. So I think I'm going to try and take my classic a bit more serious as well sort of use those strategies and ideas to sort of try and put a better team together and then decide whether a player is either going to be a pillar of my team's scoring that I can rely on each week to sort of give me a good baseline score or whether he's a player that I've just brought in to make a bit of cash and then buy one of those pillar type players that I plan on relying on for the rest of the season I'm planning on releasing another video hopefully a better, less all over the place video than this one, reviewing the draft that I've got coming up this year, sort of talking about how I went pick by pick, sort of my thought process, that sort of thing. And I'm also going to run through my AFL Fantasy Classic team before the AFL season starts. From there, though, I can't guarantee I'd have time to do like a weekly fantasy review type of video, but I definitely plan on releasing sort of several review fantasy videos throughout different stages of the season depending on how my life and everything is going at that stage. 
I imagine the more engagement for this sort of content me making me or me slash this sort of content gets, the more I'll sort of be motivated to sort of release more of it, sort of wiggle my schedule around to sort of find that extra time. But regardless, I sort of think forcing myself to sort of definitely make at least several fantasy review videos throughout the year will at a minimum encourage me to consider my own strategies more and sort of improve my own fantasy game make me a better fantasy player and I'd also sort of love to share the journey with you sort of expand true footy help Jesse to sort of make it a bit of a thing I guess I hope everybody enjoys it please sort of give me comments bit of constructive criticism that sort of thing less than constructive criticism too I'll get a laugh out of that but yeah this is my sort of first attempt at making these kind of videos so any sort of feedback would be much appreciated Thank you. Good day.